Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chanjoy is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE partnership webinar, which is titled Maternal and Neonatal Effects of In Utero Exposure to Perfluoroalkyl Ether Acids in the Spreg Dolly Rat. Our moderator today is Charles Patton, Director of Commonweal's Biomonitoring Resource Center. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 30 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Cheryl. Oh, thank you so much, Hannah. And I'm just really excited about today's presentation. It's, it's uh, my honor to um, introduce to you Justin Conley, who is a reproductive systems biologist in the reproductive and developmental toxicology branch at the US EPA at Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Currently, his research focuses on the reproductive and development toxicity of in utero exposure to individual chemicals and mixtures, primarily peripheral alkyl substances and endocrine disrupting chemicals, including pesticides and plasticizers. His work utilizes in vitro and in vivo approaches to elucidate mechanisms of toxicity, model dose response relationships, determine relative potency, and assess mixture based responses. Of course, the applied nature of this work directly informs chemical hazard and risk assessment by state and federal agencies. Today, we're going to talk about two chemicals that are uh, considered PFEA, which uh, is perfluoral alkyl ether acids, specifically GenX, which is being a used as a substitute for PFOA, and Nafion, which is a byproduct of certain industrial manufacturing processes. Dr. Conley's, Conley's research indicates that we should be deeply concerned about the impact of these chemicals that may have in human health, given that we were finding these chemicals now in water supplies and in humans. Uh, Dr. Conley, please go ahead. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, Hannah, for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you all today about um, our recent research findings. Um, first, I need to uh, state that the views I express here today are those of my own scientific opinion and don't represent those are the agency or the agency's policies necessarily. Um, and I also need to state that uh, virtually all of the data that I'll be presenting here um, is unpublished at this point. So it needs to be considered as preliminary and should not be cited directly. Although we do certainly have plans to publish all of this data in the coming months. I'd also like at the beginning to acknowledge our research team and specifically highlight Dr. Earl Gray and Christy Lambright and Nikki Evans, who have made major contributions to the work I'm gonna to present today. So my assumption um, going into this talk is that at least the majority of people who are listening in have some understanding and awareness of the PFAS chemical class, the perfluoroalkyl substances. Um, PFOS and PFOA are clearly the two most widely known. Um, largely because of their long environmental half-lives, bi uh, biological half-lives, and associations with numerous adverse health effects in humans and wildlife. Uh, because of these aspects, uh, PFOS and PFOA have largely, if not entirely, been phased out of use in manufacturing processes, but in their place, new and emerging PFAS, as I'm terming it here, such as the perfluoroalkyl ether acids, um, have been used uh, as replacements. So for example, Gen X in the lower left um, is a uh, carboxylic acid um, ether linked compound, whereas in the lower right, Nathion byproduct two has a sulfonic acid uh, functional group and two ether linkages. Gen X has been used, as Charles said, as a replacement for PFOA in the production of nonstick coatings. Uh, Nathion is a byproduct of the production of electrochemical membranes, um, and both of these compounds have been detected in surface water, drinking water, and or human serum. 
PFMOA in the middle is another carboxylic acid, uh, ether PFAS. Um, the talk today, like Charles said, is going to focus on Gen X and Napion byproduct too. We have focused on these largely because there are little to no uh, published toxicity studies. There are a few for Gen X. There are none that are, we're aware of for Napion byproduct too. Um, or PFMOAA. We have published one study on some fetal effects of Gen X, and you can see the citation here. Um, but I'm going to mostly talk about neonatal and maternal effects in this talk today. Overall, um, just our broad research objectives are to assess the maternal and perinatal effects from gestational exposure to these compounds. Um, and our, again, our focus is on chemicals that have known or documented human exposure, but little to no existing toxicity data. And within this research, our goal is also to develop um, and refine adverse outcome pathways in which we can elucidate one or more molecular initiating events, such as receptor activation, and how that molecular mechanism is associated with downstream key events at the cellular, tissue, organ, and whole animal level, and eventually uh, have a complete linkage to the adverse effects we see. And this would facilitate future uh, screening of additional chemicals as well as assist in the uh, risk assessment process. So the first slide here in, is my one slide I'll show of our in vitro mechanistic data. Uh, so we have been using in vitro um, uh, receptor activation assays for peroxisome proliferator activated receptors, so PPARs. These are uh, well documented in the literature to be associated with PFAS toxicity. So across the top, we have the PPAR alpha subtype, and across the bottom, we have the PPAR gamma subtype. On the left is the human variant, and on the right is the rat variant. Um, and the white dots with the dotted black line, that is our reference chemical in these in vitro assays. And then you can see in the gray and black lines, those are two endogenous fatty acids. So oleic uh, acid is the most abundant naturally occurring fatty acid. And then in the shades of blue, we have some carboxylic acid uh, functional group PFAS like Gen X and PFOA. And in the red shades, we have some sulfonic acid PFAS like PFOA, like PFOS and Napion byproduct too. And so, there's a lot going on in this slide, but in general, what you see is that there is more activity with the alpha subtype than the gamma. Um, there also appears to be slightly more uh, response in the human variant for alpha than the rat. Um, and then if we just kind of specifically focus on a few chemicals, at least the ones for the talk today, you can see that Gen X in the purple triangles has very high activity for P power alpha in both the human and the rat variant, and also some gamma activity. So there are two different molecular mechanisms involved. Um, whereas with Nathion, you can see that there is some human P power alpha activity, very little or no P power alpha activity in the rat, and then a, some uh, low level um, activity for P par gamma. So the overall gist is that both of these subtypes seem to be responsive to multiple different perfluorinated compounds. And there is some species difference between human and rat and, and a range of potencies across these chemicals and compared to endogenous naturally occurring fatty acids. So the rest of the slides and the rest of the talk is gonna focus on our in vivo work. Uh, we do oral exposures. We've been conducting oral exposures with pregnant Sprague Dolly rats. Uh, we do some short-term studies dosing from gestation days 14 to 18 or gestation days 16 to 20 to look at fetal effects. And then we've also done some more involved studies where we dose from gestation day eight, which is essentially post-implantation all the way through fetal development, through delivery, and to postnatal day two. And then we either terminate at postnatal day two uh, to harvest uh, neonatal tissues or allow, in some studies, the offspring to uh, grow up to adulthood to look at potentially permanent effects. And so um, the majority of what we've seen that is significant uh, has been in the neonatal period, and that's what I'm going to focus on here. And we look at a broad range of effects. I, I certainly can't cover all the data we have, uh, but I'll just go over some of the more salient points. 
but we look at things like body weight, tissue weights, uh, hormone production, hormone concentrations, clinical chemistry, a variety of uh, gene expression pathways, um, and then try to analyze uh, the concentration of the chemical and serum and tissues. So the first slide here is given that we know the compounds are active uh, for the PPAR receptors from the in vitro data and from the literature, we wanted to look at quantitative gene expression of genes that are in the PPAR signaling pathway. So we use quantitative PCR gene arrays. And so what you can see here on the left is a heat map. Uh, this is the fetal liver after a four day exposure to Gen X. And all of these genes were highly significantly upregulated. Um, you can see the dose groups to the mom across the, the bottom. Um, each of the chemicals indicates fold induction above control. And those values are only the significant values at, uh, within the given dose groups. Um, there's a break in the middle. So all the genes above the break are commonly affected between the fetal liver and the maternal liver whereas all the genes below the break are unique to the fetal liver and are unaffected in the mom. And so what's interesting is that most of these genes are associated with mitochondrial and peroxisomal fatty acid oxidation, which is common with PPAR activation. But uh, the first one below the break, that's quite interesting, PIK1. PIK1 um, is the gene transcript for an enzyme that's the rate-limiting step of gluconeogenesis, or glucose production by the liver. Um, and, gluc and this process should not be occurring in the fetal liver because all of fetal glucose comes from the mom via the placenta. Um, and so having it turned on um, is an indicator of an effect of uh, carbohydrate metabolism, which I'll touch on later. Interestingly, what I'm showing now on the right is the same analysis with the Natheon byproduct two exposed fetuses. So you can see there's only a single gene that's significantly upregulated and to a much lower degree than most of the genes for Gen X. And this is kind of consistent with our in vitro data that Gen X has really high PPAR alpha activity and Natheon byproduct two does not. And PPAR alpha is pretty prevalent in the liver. So a pretty big contrast between the two compounds. The rest of the slides, um, I'm going to show a number of these uh, box plots or violin plots. So what you'll see is on along the X axis is the dose groups in milligram per kilogram per day. So with Gen X, we're dosing from 10 to 250, and in Natheon from 0.3 to 30. Um, and you'll see the difference in a minute as to why those dose groups are so variable um, or so far apart. But basically, this first graph is showing each dot is a, a litter mean. And you can see that with Gen X, we have a significant dose responsive decrease in birth weight of the pups if they're exposed from gestation day eight through delivery. Um, and this is significant at the 30 and above dose group. With Natheon, if anything, there's a trend towards them being slightly larger, although this is not statistically significant. There's no value for the top dose with Natheon, and that's because uh, what we see here with Gen X and Natheon byproduct too is that they both produce significant neonatal mortality. So um, this is an effect that's been widely described with other P, uh, perfornated compounds, specifically PFOS and PFOA. So um, neonatal mortality has been documented with PFOS in the rat and with PFOS and PFOA in the mouse, um, although it's, uh, those chemicals produce this effect at slightly lower doses than Gen X and Napion. Um, so what you'll see is that at the top dose for each chemical, we have near complete litter loss. Um, but the dose in which Natheon produces this is about 10 times lower than Gen X. So it's considerably more potent orally. Um, the other um, notable aspect here is that with the Gen X pups, they're born appearing relatively normal and then they become moribund within about um, five to 12 hours. Whereas um, with the Natheon, the pups in the high dose group are uh, relatively on appearance wise uh, full size, but they're stillborn. So that's why we do not have um, 
birth weight for that top dose group. But so you can see this is a rather dramatic effect, but it has uh, been well um, described with other PFAS compounds. Um, if we take it out to postnatal day two, um, another uh, interesting dichotomy of effects here is that um, liver weight in the postnatal day two pups is significantly increased at all dose groups from Gen X exposure, whereas there's no effect on liver weight from the Napion exposed pups. We took subsamples of newborn livers and sent them off for independent histopathological evaluation. And the only remarkable finding that was reported back to us was a significant decrease in glycogen storage of these newborn pup livers. And so you can see on the left, a couple example images, the pink stains for glycogen essentially. And so there's a big difference between control and a high dose treated pup. And then they use the, um, Pathologists use the numerical scoring criteria, which we analyzed, and you can see a significant decrease um, for both Gen X and Napion, although the pattern obviously is somewhat different between the two. But regardless, there is a, a, a reduction in the glycogen stores. And this is really critical because one of the most important activities of the near-term fetus is glycogen deposition in the liver. You can kind of think of this as like putting gas in the gas tank because what happens during the process of delivery in the first hours of life, the glycogen that's been deposited at the end of uh, gestation is the sole, essentially the primary source of energy for the fetus, for the newborn uh, once they enter the world. And so having a high level of storage is necessary because this glycogen, as you can see in this graph, the left side is in weeks, the right side after birth is in hours. So you get a dramatic reduction in the first day of life. And, and so you need to have a fairly high level to um, sustain carbohydrate metabolism. Uh, because of this, we uh, decided to look at the newborn pup livers for um, expression of genes related to glucose metabolism. And so this is another heat map, although with these genes, they're all significantly downregulated. Um, most of these genes are associated with processes like glycolysis or the citric acid cycle in which carbohydrates are being used for ATP production. Um, and so we see this uh, down regulation of these genes largely as an effect of the pups not having enough glycogen or glucose available. So essentially they're shutting down some of their uh, carbohydrate metabolic processes. And again, if we compare Gen X to Nafion, there's a, a noticeable difference where there's only a single one of these genes was um, uh, affected as compared to control, whereas we had multiple genes in the Gen X uh, newborn pup liver. So again, even though we're seeing mortality, it seems to be through two different pathways or um, series of key events. Uh, the next uh, set of slides here, the next two or three, uh, we've been working with uh, James McCord and Mark Streiner, chemists here at EPA, to do the analytical chemical quanti quantitation. Um, so we've done quite a bit with Gen X, and we're just now working through our Napion samples. Uh, so this uh, slide is showing some maternal serum Gen X concentrations on the left and some maternal liver Gen X concentrations on the right. Um, by dose group. And so the main take home point here is that um, the box plots in the red, that's from four days of exposure, and the white box plots are 16 days of exposure. And so even though the white box plot females have been exposed for four times longer, their serum and liver concentrations are not different than the shorter um, exposure period. So this is just indicating that the chemical is not bioaccumulating um, in the liver or building up in the circulation. And this is consistent with the one toxicokinetic study that is available in the literature. Basically, Gen X does have a short half-life in the uh, female rat. The human half-life is unknown. Even though the chemical is not bioaccumulating, and this is one aspect of what people associate with PFOS and PFOA as to why they're so problematic, um, even though Gen X does not bioaccumulate, 
this duration of exposure does have a really large effect on the um, on the endpoints we measure. So this is showing maternal liver weight with the same dose uh, dose regime. The red box plots are four days of exposure. The white box plots are 16. And so you can see at the top dose, for example, at 125 milligram per kilogram per day, um, four days of exposure, the maternal livers are 110% of control, whereas after 16 days, they're 160% of control. And this also shifts our low L or our lowest observed adverse effect level from 62.5 down to 10. So this duration of exposure is um, an important aspect to consider even in the absence of a chemical being uh, bioaccumulative. This slide is my attempt to put um, our exposure concentrations that we've measured into some context with known human exposures. There are very little uh, human, there is very little human exposure data available to our knowledge. There is one single um, study in the EPA HERO database that was submitted by the manufacturer in which they sampled serum from workers at a factory in the Netherlands that was producing Gen X. And so you can see seven of the 24 uh, participants were non-detects. Um, most of them were between one and 10 nanogram per mil. A couple were between 10 and 100. And then the most, the highest worker level was 169 nanogram per milliliter. So if we take kind of a worst case scenario with that highest worker level and compare it to the average maternal serum concentration from our animal studies, we generate what we call a margin of internal exposure. So for example, um, on the, the left red column would be our lowest dose group, 10 milligram per kilogram per day. Um, and at that dose, that's where we saw changes in uh, fetal and pup liver expression. We saw changes in maternal and pup liver weight and we saw reductions in pup liver glycogen scores. Um, so at that dose, the maternal serum concentration was 10.4 times higher than the highest known human worker serum concentration that we have available. And then if you move up to the right side of that plot, that graph, where we saw the dramatic effects like neonatal mortality the average mom maternal rat serum concentration was nearly a hundred fold higher than the highest known uh, human concentration. So that just puts these levels from our studies into some context, but this is a very limited uh, sample size of, of human exposure and potentially indicates worst case considering that they're working in a manufacturing facility. So the last three slides I have is just focusing uh, uh, briefly on our uh, mixtures work. This slide is just to kind of drive home the point that there are numerous robust biomonitoring studies that clearly indicate that pregnant women carry, commonly carry exposures to more than one perfluorinated chemical at a time. And this is across multiple countries. So you can see, um, a variety of PFAS here. These are mostly the legacy straight chain ones um, that people have been studying or monitoring for historically. But regardless, um, our take is that um, it seems the most prudent to be attempting to understand mixture-based effects from co-exposures given the, given the prevalence of exposure to multiple different perfluorinated compounds among pregnant and non-pregnant people. Um, it's important to anchor mixture-based studies to the individual chemical effects. So you need to know what each chemical is doing individually in order to assess the mixture-based effects. So we took our uh, dose response curves for the neonatal mortality for Gen X and Natheon byproduct 2, which you can see here in the blue and the green. And then we used Chris Lau's um, neonatal mortality data for PFOS because he used the same uh, uh, he used the same Sprague Dolly rat strain as we did with a roughly similar dosing interval. So you can see that PFOS is the most potent with an ED50 of three milligram per kilogram per day. Natheon um, is about three, three or so fold 
weaker with the ED50 of about 10, and then Gen X is the weakest on an oral basis of an, with an ED50 of about 110. So we use those ED50s to make a fixed ratio mixture dosing regime. So at the top dose, we have each chemical at the ED50, and then we did three fold dilutions down to each chemical at 1% of the top dose, again, in a fixed ratio. And so um, we're still generating data from this study right now, um, but without going too deeply into it, uh, a kind of a standard approach for mixtures toxicology is to use established mixture models, including the dose addition model and the response addition model to see uh, to, to make predictions of what you would expect the chemicals to do. So what you can see here in the blue solid line and the blue circles, that's our observed data for uh, the neonatal mortality effect. And the green dotted line would be the prediction from the dose addition model, and the red solid line is the prediction from the response addition model. Response addition is basically saying, this is what we would predict if the chemicals were acting independently via different mechanisms or had different processes. Whereas the dose addition model is assuming the chemicals all act similarly and are acting in a cumulative manner. And so you can see very clearly here that the observed data really closely matches the dose addition model, which is a good, a really strong indicator of cumulative dose additive effects. Another way to kind of look at this data is just to say, okay, how do the individual chemicals respond in, um, within the mixture? So I just pulled out Gen X. And so this is pup birth weight. Um, and so I modeled an effect of an ED80. So an ED80 in this case would be about equivalent to a 20% reduction in pup birth weight. Um, and so what you can see is that Gen X alone has an ED80 of 164 milligram per kilogram, whereas within this mixture with Nafion and PFOS, the ED80 is about two and a half times lower at about 70 milligram per kilogram. So this is rather important from a risk assessment perspective and from benchmark dose modeling to understand that the, the response curves shift um, in relationship to mixture-based co-exposures. Um, I'll wrap up uh, here and just basically say that there are a number of adverse effects that we've observed for Gen X and Nathion. Uh, largely, the only effect that seems to be very clearly common between the two is the pup mortality. Otherwise, there appears to be much more liver-based effects with Gen X than with Nathion although there are some other endpoints that I was not able to cover here. Um, and in general, these effects um, are relatively consistent with those that have been previously published for PFOA and PFOS, although the, do the oral doses for Gen X and Nathion are higher to produce these effects than for PFOA and PFOS. Um, it does seem like alpha and gamma PPAR receptors are involved and it's not just a single mechanism. Um, we also um, have seen some other receptor activities, but these uh, were demonstrated here. Exposure duration is important, even though you don't have bioaccumulation, and that uh, looking at internal dosimetry is really critical for comparing potency across compounds, as well as understanding uh, relevance to human exposures, and we do see pretty clear evidence of dose additive effects. Um, and with that, I'll stop um, my emails at the bottom so you can contact me and I'm happy to take any questions right now. Well, thank you very much for that um, excellent presentation. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of time here, but I've got a question for you from uh, Erica Schrader from Toxics Free Futures. Uh, and her question is, what is understood about the mechanism by which PFOS causes neonatal mortality and what are potential mechanisms for, for Nafion? Yeah, so it seems uh, to me that um, with Gen X, the carboxylate, um, PPAR alpha seems to play um, a substantial role. This was also described in some knockout mouse studies that Barbara Abbott conducted here at EPA um, a number of years ago, um, in which she created a PPAR, knockout, PPAR alpha knockout mouse that was relatively resistant to the neonatal mortality effect. 
um, it does seem to me that um, it is a combination of effects both on lipid metabolism as well as carbohydrate metabolism. So um, if you're increasing fatty acid oxidation, you're lowering your lipid concentrations, and that also seems to have an effect on having an, a significantly high enough glucose concentration to uh, kind of sustain the transition from the womb to uh, the world. Uh, in terms of what is going on with Nathan, I, I don't really know. Um, as you can see, a lot of the stuff we've interrogated so far hasn't produced much in the way of um, not many genes being turned on, um, not a lot of activity in the in vitro assays. Um, so I'm not really sure mechanistically uh, what is going on there and why the, there seems to be such a difference between the two. Other than um, I wasn't able to cover here, but the, the Nafion does, um, relative to the oral dose, there is a much higher serum concentration in the maternal rat for Nafion than there is for um, Gen X. Mm. The half-life seems to be much longer for Nathion than for Gen X in the maternal rat. Well, that's so interesting. So what, what, uh, we're almost out of time here, oh, but, uh, and I know people will have questions and, 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 and Hannah will tell people how to get in touch with you later on. And hopefully given your time constraints of receiving response, but what kind of impact is your research having on uh, any kind of regulatory process in terms of safe levels in drinking water? Uh, I, I can't say I know specifically other than, you know, our dose response data has been incorporated, I know, um, into um, the risk assessment process here in North Carolina uh, by state agencies. Um, our work has also been cited by, um, I believe, the, um, the equivalent of the EPA for the Netherlands who has been doing a risk assessment for Gen X. Um, and we've also talked to and shared our data with risk assessors in the Office of Water here at EPA. They're conducting a risk assessment for Gen X. So uh, we, we do know that our um, data has in real time been used by multiple state, federal, and international regulatory agencies um, for Gen X. Um, and we hope and expect that the data for Nafion would be useful in the same way. No, I'm sure it will be. Well, I think we're out of time, but I just want to thank you again for your extremely important research. Um, and I, I think it'll have a greater impact as you continue on, and we hope to help publicize that as well. Uh, so thanks a lot, Justin. Really appreciate you taking the time to do this, and we hope to have you back at some point as you continue on with further research. So I hope it will be agreeable. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Hannah, do you want to... Okay, Anna, do you want to do your formal close, please? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Justin and Charles. We're approaching the end of our webinar today. A video recording will be available on Che's website soon. Tomorrow, you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Che, aka Partnership Call, will take place January 26th and is titled From the St. Louis River to St. Louis, Lawrence Island, the role of community-engaged research in, in achieving environmental health and justice. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you're new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming webinars and more, please step, sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speaker, Dr. Conley, for taking time to present today, and to Charles for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a great day.